tonight, the rescues in the rubble, three days after Morocco's worst earthquake in a century. Devastating new images of the destruction. Everything is very difficult for us. No food, no water. As Moroccan Canadians here fear the worst. Everyone is panicking. Everybody is worried about his family. The Prime Minister's plane grounded after a high-profile international summit. It's embarrassing. As a country, it's embarrassing. Stuck in India after reports of a diplomatic snub. Plus, a deep dive into the world of deep fakes. You can't trust visual media, and so you have to think critically about it. The dangers of AI-generated video and distinguishing between what's real and what's not. So don't underestimate it. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. There is a jarring juxtaposition of life and death in Morocco tonight, where there have been incredible stories of survival, even as the death toll soars. The massive earthquake has killed more than 2,800 people. These new aerials show the scope of the catastrophe, the challenge for rescuers, and the incredible need for urgent help. But so far, Morocco has only accepted aid from just four countries, Spain, Qatar, Britain, and the United Arab Emirates, because it says it wants to avoid a lack of coordination. That's a stark contrast to Turkey's approach earlier this year when it launched an international appeal after its devastating quake in February. CTV's Heather Wright on the devastation and hope in the disaster zone. Signs of hope amid scenes of devastation. These men rescued in Morocco after three days buried beneath collapsed buildings. Still, the grief is everywhere. Another victim laid to rest as the death toll from Friday's earthquake nears 3,000. The earthquake happened, says Brahim, and the ceilings fell, collapsing on his seven-year-old son who was sleeping. He was killed in his bed. This video shows the violent shaking in Marrakesh, but the worst of the damage is in small towns and villages in the Atlas Mountain region south of the city. Their rescuers are racing to find survivors still buried beneath the rubble. The destruction is absolute, says Antonio Nogales with United Firefighters Without Borders. All the buildings have collapsed. We will begin our search using dogs and try to find survivors. The government has promised to compensate those affected by the earthquake and says it is providing drinking water, along with food, tents and blankets. But this man says help has yet to arrive to his village. Everything is gone, he says. We lost everything. We lost the entire house. There are no officials visiting us. There's no help or aid. Crews are struggling to access many of the hardest hit areas with roads blocked and entire villages destroyed. The more time that goes by in the next few hours, um, it stops being a rescue mission. Dr. Anna Banerjee was on the ground in Haiti following the devastating earthquake in 2010. She says even those who survived the initial earthquake are still at risk. If it's hard to access these communities, then you have something as simple as water, food, uh, supplies, sanitation. Often the sanitation, if there is any, is destroyed. And so that causes a whole bunch of infectious diseases. Many countries, including Canada, have offered to support Morocco. But so far, the kingdom has only accepted aid from four countries, saying it will ask for help in the future if needed. Omar. Heartbreaking stories. All right, Heather, thank you. 2,000 people are feared dead and thousands unaccounted for after massive flooding in eastern Libya. One of the hardest hit areas is the port city of Derna. Entire neighborhoods are destroyed. Authorities are appealing for international help. The prime minister is waiting on a spare part or a replacement plane to bring him back home after his aircraft was grounded following the G20 summit in India. The Canadian delegation is now expected to depart in a few hours. As CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver reports, the mechanical breakdown coincides with a diplomatic one. The Delhi district is lively again. Businesses and streets closed during the G20 have now reopened. 
But more than 30 hours after the summit's end, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's plane is still sitting on the tarmac and unable to fly him home. It's embarrassing. As a country, it's embarrassing. Why is it that the plane that the Prime Minister is traveling on is breaking down? And what does that say about how we are taking care of the infrastructure around our leaders in the country if this is what he has to deal with? Trudeau was supposed to leave Sunday night, but a technical issue grounded the plane. The part needed to get the aircraft airbound is now en route with a technician flying commercial. The problem likely related to the aircraft's age. The 80s era Polaris fleet is nearing the end of its lifespan. Canada has purchased replacement planes, but the only one delivered won't be ready for the Prime Minister until at least this fall. We keep and operate uh, equipment way too long. Uh, we let it go uh, lots of different uh, fleets. We operate past 30 years of age, which is way before the best replace date. Um, we should simply have bought a new plane like this about 10 years ago. Ottawa was hoping this trip to India would be incident free, since his last visit in 2018 is often described as a disaster. Instead, this visit was marred by several short and awkward moments at the G20 with host Prime Minister Narendra Modi and bad press by Indian newspapers who are reporting Trudeau was snubbed by the Indian government, who they say refused Canada's request for an official bilateral meeting. The fact that the meeting didn't go particularly well, which is the narrative in the media today, coupled with the fact that essentially the Prime Minister and his team are stuck there, um, is a really poor reflection of the planning that we have. The Prime Minister's office says the the earliest departure for the Canadian delegation is late Tuesday afternoon. That means it's likely the Prime Minister will miss at least part of his Liberal caucus retreat in London, Ontario. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, New Delhi. Opening arguments began today in the trial of a man accused of killing a Muslim family in London two years ago. CTV's Nick Paparella on the admission the Crown said the accused made to police. In her opening address, Federal Crown Attorney Sarah Sheikh wasted little time in highlighting two police statements and pointing the finger at the accused, 22-year-old Nathaniel Veltman. She said that after planning it for three months on June 6th of 2021, Mr. Veltman got into his truck and went to search for Muslims to kill. He found the Afsal family walking along Hyde Park Road in West London. The Crown said Veltman told police because of what they were wearing, he made a U-turn and drove directly at them. In his own words, he was going pedal to the metal. The Crown said after his arrest, Veltman told police, I killed a bunch of people. I knew what I was doing. I don't regret what I did. I admit that it was terrorism. The Crown said it would show that Veltman is a white nationalist with extreme right-wing views. Veltman pled not guilty to four counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Four members of the Afsal family, Father Salman, Mother Medea, daughter Yumna and grandmother Talat, all died when they were run over by a pickup truck. The lone survivor, a nine-year-old boy who is now 11, is living with family. For the first time at the trial, relatives of the Afsal family are seated in the body of the courtroom. Every once in a while, you can see that they are visibly upset. The first to testify at the trial was a family member who isn't being identified. The Afsals were described as a peace-loving family. Yumna was called the sweet girl, whose life was cut short. She was only 15 years old. The Crown submitted this photo as its first exhibit at the trial. Nick Paparella, CTV News, Windsor. Ontario, along with BC and Alberta, have been waging a long and desperate battle to stop the spread of the deadly opioid crisis. Now, new evidence that has spread to another province. Here's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin. Montreal police and paramedics rushed to a downtown street. The call, several suspected overdoses all at once. Six people were taken to hospital. Four from a street corner, two from a nearby shelter, offering support to Indigenous community members. A total panic, uh, and a couple of people were in critical condition from what I hear. The overdoses are potentially linked to fentanyl, raising the alarm level in Quebec. In July, the province, once seemingly sheltered from the worst of the crisis, reported a record number of overdoses. We've seen that in other provinces, and we will act on their experience. In 2022, 87% of deaths and 90% of hospitalizations linked to opioid intoxication happened in British Columbia, Alberta and Ontario. Over the first week of September in Toronto, there were 11 suspected deaths, double the weekly average. We've been telling 
the authorities and the government here in Quebec, it's coming. Isabelle Fortier is a passionate advocate for Mom's Stop the Harm, giving, she says, Sarah Jean, the daughter she lost to drug intoxication in 2019, a voice. So she was 24, it's way too young to, to die, but she died of a contaminated drug. Uh, she was unaware of what she was taking exactly. Fortier has pushed the government to decriminalize possession, to invest in treatment. But she also urges people to have naloxone on hand. It rapidly reverses an opioid overdose. And we're fortunate here in Quebec, it's free. Montreal Public Health has opened an investigation to determine the exact circumstances, but also to look into what else it can do in terms of prevention. At the shelter, workers are still reeling but focusing on solutions. What's the work that we can be doing to encourage people to use safe injection sites to get their supply tested? Or else she fears the crisis will get far worse. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. In Calgary, the number of E. coli cases has jumped dramatically. 231 people infected, 26 of those hospitalized. Four of the 11 daycares were given the green light to reopen today, a week after the outbreak was declared. A bulletproof train carrying Kim Jong-un has reportedly crossed into Russia ahead of a meeting with Vladimir Putin. Each has something the other wants. CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Malbin on Why Now. Kim Jong-un's slow-moving, heavily armored green train en route to Russia. Tourists posing for photos of the rare event. It's been four years since Kim ventured outside secret of North Korea to meet with Russian leader Vladimir Putin. And Kim has something Putin wants. North Korea is saying, hey, we'll support you the full 100 percent. You know, we're your best friends. Uh, we'll provide arms. Military experts say Putin is desperate, courting Kim for weapons for Russia's brutal war against Ukraine. In exchange, Kim wants technology for nuclear-powered submarines and satellites and badly needed food and fuel. We don't think it's a social visit, but with respect to what the outcome uh, might end up being, let's just wait and, and see what comes out of the meeting. If there is some kind of an arms deal, the U.S. is warning there will be a price to pay. We will continue to enforce those sanctions and will not hesitate to impose new sanctions if appropriate. But analysts say even more harsh sanctions won't deter either nation. And since former President Donald Trump failed to rein in Kim's nuclear ambitions, Russia makes him relevant again. I think the biggest concern here that we're unspoken is maybe the nuclear use and that North Korea or Russia might be the first country to break that taboo by using a so-called tactical nuclear weapon on the battlefield. The Kremlin vows to strengthen its friendship with Kim. This high stakes meeting described as a full scale visit with an official dinner that could come as soon as Tuesday. Omar. All right, Joy, thanks. An incredible moment in southern Turkey tonight as American researcher Mark Dickey was rescued from one of the deepest caves in the world. <laughs> Dickey was brought to the surface after being trapped more than a thousand meters underground. It is amazing to be above ground again. I was underground for far longer than ever expected with an, with an unexpected medical issue. The delicate operation to free him began on Saturday. The 40-year-old had been trapped days after falling ill September 2nd with severe gastrointestinal bleeding. Doctors gave him blood transfusions and IV fluids before they gave him the okay for the rescue mission to begin. A massive sigh of relief. Coming up after the break. His smile and his compassion and his joyfulness and his selflessness. Remembering a Canadian volunteer killed in Ukraine. Plus, making a splash to combat climate change. Tens of thousands have lost their lives in the nearly 19 months since Russia invaded Ukraine. Global Affairs says 1,300 Canadians are currently registered in Ukraine, and five have died since the war began. Most recently, a volunteer from Ontario, CTV's Adrian Gobriel, met in Kyiv a few months ago. Is your family okay with you being here? Anthony Einat was your typical Canadian. Played a lot of hockey as a kid. Though his decision to go to Ukraine was far from ordinary. You're seeing the buildings blowing up. I felt I had to get over here and help out in any way I could. 
Known as Tonko by his friends, the 58-year-old and his infectious smile greeted us on a brisk February morning in Kyiv, 11 months after he'd arrived to volunteer, aware of the constant risks. Really the danger's obviously there. I want to you know, use my time to help as much as I can. You're here for the long haul. Yes. In June, Inat messaged me, writing, I've been spending time in the East lately, delivering humanitarian aid, evacuations, driving medical teams around to different villages. He was doing just that near Bakhmut on Saturday, when Ukrainian officials say his vehicle took a direct hit from a Russian anti-tank missile. Inat and a Spanish aid worker were killed. Remember him for his smile and his compassion and his joyfulness and his selflessness. Fellow Canadian Adam Oak spent months delivering aid with Inat in Ukraine. Oh. Through hard-hit villages and intense shelling. Very compassionate human being and hardworking, dedicated. Adam, how many people have you known who've died in Ukraine? Uh, seven. Oak is going back to Ukraine in November. Continue what Tonko has, has done for the last year and a half. Einat was working to get his permanent residency so he could stay in Ukraine after the war was over to help rebuild. Some people might say what you're doing here is remarkable. What would you say to that? It's not remarkable. The, the people here are remarkable and whatever I could do to help is the least I could do. A humble man who helped thousands. Tonko Einat was an extraordinary individual as was the sacrifice he made for the people of Ukraine. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. And nearly 3,000 people were remembered in New York today on the 22nd anniversary of the September 11th attacks. At the site of what became known as Ground Zero, the names of the victims were read. Kenneth William Baznicki. Ken Baznicki from Toronto was at a conference in the North Tower of the World Trade Center. First and foremost, you know, we remember, you know, my dad, uh, I was 16 at the time, uh, the loss, 9-11 uh, affected uh, the world, 24 Canadians were killed. There were also events in this country, including this one at the Peace Arch near the Canada-U.S. border in B.C. Still ahead. Help you achieve your wildest dreams of making thousands of dollars in just a few days. AI generated video scams and why seeing shouldn't always be believing. Cyber criminals are increasingly relying on high-tech tools like AI to lure unsuspecting victims. There is a troubling new surge featuring phony clips, one involving the very show you're watching. CTV's John Venavelli Rao on how to stay ahead of the scammers. As one of the first 500 people to get it for free. From a bogus video made to look like a product endorsement from an American morning show host. Impressive. It sounds like a real investor's dream to a deep-faked ad featuring an interview with a cloned Elon Musk. There's some of the many scam ads popping up on the web well, look. using technology to imitate media personality. Feel like you're paying too much for weed in Canada? Including this phony ad appearing to show our own anchor, Omar, endorsing a cannabis company. We've seen other anchors from other news outlets be deep-faked and uh, celebrities like Elon Musk uh, we see quite frequently. And today, I want to introduce my new project. While deep fakes have been around for about five years, they used to take a lot of time to produce. But thanks to recent improvements in voice and face cloning, they've become much easier for fraudsters to make. Almost anyone, if they spent enough time and effort, could create their own deep fake, which is a scary thought. To clone my own voice took less than five minutes. All I had to do was upload a few samples to a website. And this was the result. This a cloned version of my voice. I created a Tesla Trader project. And while some of the current scam videos are only moderately convincing, experts are deeply concerned even the cheap ones will soon be almost impossible to spot. The important point to remember is the deep fakes you see now are going to be the worst you're ever going to see for the rest of your life. It's only going to get better. Experts say if you're trying to spot a deep fake, you should check to see if the lips are in sync with the voice 
and watch for the eye movement. Like the way that pupils look and where they're looking, lighting, the amount of lighting, and if the lighting is different from the background lighting, that's a huge tell. If you spot a suspicious ad, report it to both the platform you're using and the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center. But ultimately, experts say you now need to think of video as being as easy to fake that's as an email and trust it accordingly. John Venavelli Rouse, CTV News, exactly Toronto. And wine lovers might wish this next piece of video was fake, but in fact, it's real. That's two million liters of red wine flooding the streets of a small village in Portugal. Two tanks owned by a local distillery burst on Sunday, releasing enough wine to fill an Olympic swimming pool. The accident painted the town red, leaving walls stained. The distillery says it will cover damages and all of the cleanup costs. Well, after the break, cutting carbon beneath the surface, diving into a Canadian first for deep sea research. More than 1,000 meters below the ocean's surface off British Columbia, there's a fascinating experiment unfolding. CTV's Yvonne Raymond on the cutting-edge tech that could help cut carbon from the atmosphere. Canadians are keen to see more solutions fighting climate change. Probably right up top, given the potential consequences if the trend isn't reversed. And a new project off the coast of Vancouver Island is among those committed to the bigger picture. We're going to have to remove CO2 out of the atmosphere to keep the planet habitable for humans and biodiversity. Ocean Networks Canada and an American ocean health company have plunged below the surface, planting a device that'll help gather research to see whether technology can be used to enhance the ocean's natural ability to pull carbon from the atmosphere. We kind of have two primary primary mechanisms. Uh, one is through growing macroalgae uh, in the open ocean and then having it sunk to the seafloor. The other is having um, wood or other terrestrial-based biomass that has been grown on land and then sinking that to the seafloor. That's why the experimental test lies 1,300 meters below the ocean's surface south of Tofino in the Clackwatt Slope. How are the, these substrates degrading? Um, what, what comes, what is interested in potentially consuming or remineralizing this organic carbon? Scientists are watching the lander over the next year. And because the ocean is such a big part of the planet, it would be negligent of us for not looking at it in terms of research. If it's successful, scientists see potential scaling up, bringing solutions for a world crisis home. Yvonne Raymond, CTV News, Oak Bay. That's a snapshot of this Monday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow. Five crucial questions to expose the truth. Who's at risk? What needs to change? When will justice be done? There was actually a plot to kill you. Where's the proof? Why did this happen? Watch W5 Saturdays at 7 on CTV.